So now, continuing with our study of the domain eukarya, we're going to now be establishing the next step, the next logical sequence in regards to that serial endosymbiosis hypothesis. And we'll also uh, explore the idea of eukaryotic evolution and the relationship to protists in a little bit more detail in this next video. So we'll entitle this next flowchart Domain Eukarya 2, just to wrap up our understanding of this broad, complex, and uh, very interesting evolutionary history uh, of this domain Eukarya. So, to go right into it, previously we established primary endosymbiosis. We have a cell, we have another living cell, and one of those cells is probably large, it's going to eat the other living cell and exhibit primary endosymbiosis, so long as it doesn't digest that other cell. So, we can actually add a fold of complexity to this by understanding that this is not the end of the serial endosymbiosis story. Serial endosymbiosis are sequences of these events, and thus that means that there must certainly be a possibility for something known as secondary endosymbiosis another endosymbiosis on top of an already endosymbiosis. It's a bit of an inception-like uh, thing to study here, and we'll see what we have in terms of this secondary endosymbiosis. So now, uh, very simply speaking, we have a host cell, just like we always do, and that host cell engulfs a primary endosymbiotic cell, as I alluded to before. Engulfs primary endosymbiotic cell. And the host cell in this situation, HC for host cell, is probably going to be, and usually is, a heterotrophic eukaryote. Okay? Usually, as you can see already, most of the time, the thing that's engulfing something else is heterotrophic. It's anaerobic. It needs to do things on its own. But the reason why it's engulfing something else, like a primary endosymbiont, is because that primary endosymbiont probably has the capabilities of helping this heterotroph out and allowing him or her, whatever it may be, to turn uh, its, its capabilities into more of an autotrophic manner, as we saw in the story of the amyoplasts. So, that's our basic premise of secondary endosymbiosis. What relevance does this have to our protist story? Protists are important in terms of secondary endosymbiosis for the following reason. If we look at red plus green algae, which are two photosynthetic protists, red plus green algae, which were the result of what? They were the result of primary endosymbiosis. They actually underwent, we'll write this down, underwent serial endosymbiosis. Serial endo symbiosis, so they would actually get consumed by somebody else. They're already a primary endosymbiont with an amyoplast, and they're going to get consumed by somebody else in this next sequence, in this next serial endosymbiosis. We can state that this frequently happened, and there's a good figure in your textbook that I'll refer to a little bit later on in terms of understanding this visually. This frequently happened, and thus, because of this frequent consumption, this frequent serial endosymbiosis here and there and there and there, we get a great, 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 absolutely amazing amount of protist diversity on planet Earth. This is why it's very difficult to study protists because there's so much diversity associated with them and we'll try to tackle that diversity problem as we move forward. Now, uh, a figure I would like you to definitely look at to really drive home this point, figure 28.3 in your textbook, it shows the series, a series of endosymbionts and endosymbiotic events very nicely to really drive home this point that red and green algae served as a primary endosymbiotic result that then got consumed by another different organism, another heterotrophic eukaryote, leading to great protist diversity, as you'll see in the figure. Trust me, the figure is very nice to really understand this point if you're confused. So, moving forward with eukarya, we never really even got to the idea of what eukaryotic cells are. We've only mentioned their history, their origin. Now we can actually establish what a eukaryotic cell truly is, and we'll do that right over here. Uh, eukaryotic cell structure. Hopefully this is all review for most of us, um, and this is a very basic idea of what a eukaryotic cell is. We're doing a great injustice to the complexity of a eukaryote, but uh, we'll cover the basics. First and foremost, it's a eukaryote. It's a true cell, thus it has a true nucleus, 
doesn't have a nucleoid region like a prokaryote, it has a true membrane-bound nucleus, and also, speaking of membrane-bound, it also has true membrane-bound organelles. Let's not forget that from Bio 1. Okay, those are two major characteristics of all eukaryotic cell structures, and one that we probably haven't gone over in great detail is also the cytoskeleton. It's a very complex and advanced cytoskeleton that allows for a good amount of structural support for the cell, more so than a prokaryotic cell, definitely, and it also aids in movement. Now, we know prokaryotic cells are capable of movement based off of, off of our previous understanding of prokaryotes, but this movement is a lot more complex. This structure that's supported is a lot more complex, so much so that eukaryotic cells are capable of great amounts of shape changes, protists especially, and also advanced feeding mechanisms, again, both of which are exemplified by the protist group, by the protist um, entire sh diversity of the protist, show the shape changes and feeding events that we'll see as we cover the protist. Finally, last thing to understand about the eukaryotes, this domain, is the fact that the evolutionary history of eukaryotes, as sort of a summary, eukaryotic evolution is very, very difficult to study for all uh, evolutionary biologists, for phylogeneticists, for even taxonomists, people that are naming and classifying, because eukaryotes themselves are a domain that is constantly in flux. It is constantly in flux. This would mean that the eukaryotes, um, though they, they separate themselves into four supergroups, we'll get into those supergroups as we move forward throughout Bio2, actually, we'll delve into all of them. Um, the problem with these four supergroups, the problem with the domain itself, is that there is no known root. There is no known singular common ancestor, in other words. And that is not good for somebody who's studying an evolution of an organism or a class of organisms like eukaryotes because you don't know what the common ancestor is. The reason why there's no known root, and we can establish this as a secondary point, I'm sort of point to it right over here, the reason why is because um, what we notice is that based off of the uh, history that we study, the evolutionary history, there was a simultaneous divergence from a common ancestor. So it wasn't just stepwise, and I'll explain that in just a second. Simultaneous divergence from one supposed, let's say, common ancestor. It wasn't just somebody evolved into somebody else, and then on top of that, we had some more evolution, more, 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 um, then we get to a complex organism. That stepwise pattern, it was uh, as if one common, common ancestor was there, somebody evolved, and then somebody evolved um, away from that individual. This is going to be seen especially in figure 26.21. It's a great way to visualize what I was just saying in terms of the simultaneous divergence. That's a key idea to understand about the flux of eukaryotic evolution. Um, in summary, the figure 26.21 shows us that eukarya, this domain, it's, it's an uncomfortable domain because it shows polytomy. And if we remember from bio 1, from classification, from phylogeny especially, polytomy is no good in terms of understanding evolutionary history because this means that there is more than one common ancestor. We don't know what diverged first, and that's especially shown in this figure, which I definitely suggest you looking at. Finally, in terms of the supergroups, we can finally give them some names, and we'll conclude on that subject. In terms of the supergroups, we have one, two, three, four supergroups to study. Number one, which we'll cover today, will be Excavata. We will also have the Sarclade. And there will also be the Archaeplastida, which is another supergroup. Look at that plastid term that should already start ringing some bells. And then finally, Uniconta. And that is actually going to be studied over the course of three lectures. That's a very large uh, chunk of Bio 116. Finally, uh, to understand these four supergroups, to put them into perspective, I suggest looking at figure 28.2 because you will notice from this, ask yourself, what are most of the things on figure 28.2? I can already tell you that most, all of these are protists, all of these are protists, and most of these are protists. Thus, in figure 28.2, you will see that most eukaryotes, and a lot of people don't know this, 
are actually the single-celled, sometimes multicellular organisms called protists. Most eukaryotes are protists. This is why we needed all of this background information on eukarya before we even got into studying the diversity of protists. There's a great amount of diversity. It's a very confusing um, and really spread out uh, group of organisms that we'll study in the next couple of flowcharts and videos.